Joining us live now is Phil Curry, political editor at the Australian Financial Review. Phil, thank you for your time. Pleasure, Annalise. Now, really interesting, we've got more instances mm. of underpayments coming through this morning. Is this just becoming an endemic issue with how we pay staff in Australia? Well, it is according to the Industrial Relations Minister. Um, Christian Porter, who used that term yesterday, it's endemic in the culture and uh, not good enough, he said. So, look, it's, it's, it's clearly not a binary or a black and white issue. I mean, I, I can't imagine all these companies doing it deliberately and thinking they're going to get away with it. So maybe there is an element of something in there. But at the end of the day... All, all the error is on the underpayment side. No one's being overpaid. Um, which, you know. I'm sure it must happen at some point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, they're not, no one's only up to overpaying workers. Um, there seems to be a lot of blame on the award system, which, even though that's been simplified. But and has been pointed out, I think, by Ewan Hannan in The Australian on multiple occasions that you know, these companies devote enormous resources and time towards making sure they can minimise their tax tax and other, other sorts of things and not these specific companies and offshore their arrangements and so forth so why is it so hard to get your pay arrangements right so I think it's an entirely legitimate area of concern and you know one the government's not cutting the, the companies any slack on with you know they're going to bring in these rules and and their rhetoric's very strong on it so um the rules and rhetoric are one thing but you mm. need penalties you need yeah, the fear yeah. to be put in them mm. otherwise uh, otherwise it will just be that kind of cost of doing business yeah look if it's a one-off or something you know a bit of leniency but if it's systemic definitely not and uh uh, look, it's just not good enough. You've got to pay people what, what they're meant to be paid, and uh, at the end of the day, that's what that's what matters. I mean, you know, wages growth and there's enough of a problem in this country that people are getting even less than they're entitled to. Mm. And one of the interesting things I found in this discussion too is about how the nature of work has changed. People work odd mm. hours more. They work um, mm. overtime. Often you're on your phone at home checking emails, mm. and that's all part of your work day. And so a lot of it's to do with compensating that. We've seen the mm. big four firms now looking at having their employees clock in and out just so they can say exactly when they were actually working. Yeah, it's quite sort of back to the future, isn't it? The yeah. old cashless economy is back. Look, I, I can understand that. I mean, especially when what we do, you know, you, you never shuts off. Well, I mean, we just get paid a salary and you expect it to, you know, answer your phone at 9 o'clock at night. There's a lot more there. Yeah. I think it's being practical for people to take home some time sheet and say, oh, I've got, a, you know, an email at 7 p.m. and... You know, I worked for five minutes that night. But, you know, it, it, it's a good example, Annalisa, just how the work day has now blurred into, the, into your private life. Mm. I mean, emails and mobile phones have just destroyed that barrier between work and work and home. And so if that's an element of it, I think it's probably healthy we have a discussion about it. I, I don't look at emails after I go home. I figure if it's urgent enough, someone's going to ring me. Um, if someone, oh, I emailed you last night. I said, sorry, mate, it was 9 o'clock. I was watching TV. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was with the kids. So. You're a little more progressive. Yeah, but I think, that's a tangential, <laughs> I think that's a tangential issue. I think that it's more about you know, the systemic underpayment that's going on you know, yeah. for normal daylight hours. Yeah. On the same topic of wages, mm. though, we've seen this discussion happening around superannuation, about mm. whether the compulsory contribution mm. should go up to 12% as it is slated to. Mm. And this is becoming a real undermining issue within the coalition. There's a mm. very vocal group of MPs who obviously don't support super at all mm. and then certainly don't support it being raised to 12%. Yeah, there's a bit of ideology creeping into this. Look, the super guarantee's been around forever. Had John Howard not frozen it when um, he got into power, it would have hit 12% decades ago and we wouldn't be having this discussion. And it would have hit 12% during the period of the mining boom where wages were going through the roof and everyone was affluent. Well, not everyone, but there's general affluency. So... It, it sort of shows that when the money's there, it's not a problem. When the money's not there and wages are flat, it does become a concern. You know, people would have been a lot better off in terms of retirement savings had the Howard government not done what it had done, but I guess you can't rewind the clock now. So there is a legitimate sort of argument, I guess, where people are saying, you know, it's it, look, we're talking half a percent a year from 2021 to 2025. It's not a huge wage rise, if you were to forego your super increase and allow it to phase up to 12%, you're talking half a percentage point. Mm. So I'm not quite sure about that. But um, you know, Albanese is giving a speech today and I think he's making that point. He's going back and saying, well, you should be able to have both. You should be able to have reasonable wage increases and then allow that super to creep up to 12%. The guarantee creep from 95 to 12 as legislated. You'll find the government you know, its preferred course of action is actually to tidy up the superannuation system. I think if they try to reverse that legislation, there'd be a massive fight. It just wouldn't be worth their while. And their energies are better expended in getting rid of the ticket clippers in the super system, the fees on the low, low accounts, the, mm. yeah, the, the, the multiple accounts, and that sort of thing, and just trying to sort of make sure that the money going in there is benefiting the person, not 
not, not the, you know, these, these people who are sticking their hand in the pot along the way. And Jane Hume is sort of quite good on all that stuff. And I thought she was quite good last week when she pulled out, a, withdrew her Australian super account. I mean, outrageously. You know, the government has done the right thing and got rid of these fees on low, low income accounts. Mm. Which, uh, and so Australian super said, OK, we're just going to whack fees up on all our on all our high, high, high income accounts to make up for that. I mean, it's just yeah. outrageous behaviour and, and Jane Hume quite rightfully, you know, changed her super account to someone else. But that sort of shows the mentality within super as if they've got so much dough and yet they're still clipping the ticket. So that's where you should be cleaning it up. I don't think you should be sort of limiting what people are going to accumulate for retirement. And just finally, the other topic of discussion today is around luxury car tax. Mm. This was introduced to protect local car manufacturers, mm. which no longer exist. Mm. So why should taxpayers be forking out? Well, well, they shouldn't be. And, and it's not just luxury car tax, as Andrew Tillett writes in our paper today. There also, there's also tariffs still. There's still import tariffs on, mm. on imported cars. Now, you know, one of the reasons Holden died was, was you know, when the Hawk button you know, got rid of automotive tariffs, so phased it out, people thought, actually, I've now got more choices. I can buy a European car or a Japanese car. Um, and, and so it's been this gradual thing. Now, Holden's gone. They don't make Fords or Toyotas here anymore. There's absolutely no reason to protect the local industry in terms of the cars, maybe components, but certainly not with cars. So, look, I imagine the, the government, because they're, they're, they're terrified about their budget surplus, now's not the time to give away a billion dollars. That is a very cynical mm. thing for the government to say, though, is that we're not going to get rid of it while we mm. aren't in surplus. The whole point of a tax is it's supposed to be related to whatever you're raising the tax. Oh, that's right. Yeah, there's, no, there's no principle to keep tariffs or, 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 or the luxury car tax, none at all. But, and I suspect that had the economy not tanked as it has in the last six months, it's probably something they could announce in the budget we've gotten rid of. Mm. But uh, at the moment, when they're clinging on for dear life, uh, read the surplus slash balance. Uh, they'll, they'll find a reason not to get rid of it for now. And it's just, uh, it's going to limit competition in the market as well. Oh, of course, yeah, of course it does. But, I mean, what's, yeah, I mean, it's just as plain as the nose on your face. There's no there's no reason why it's there. Um, the only reason they'll be clinging on to it is they need the revenue. And, wow. uh, but it'll be an increasingly difficult argument to maintain, and I suspect um, it's... They're going to have to get rid of it. And where's soon. Labor on this? We've asked a few Labor MPs this morning and mm. no-one wants to come out and say, of course we should get rid of it. Why? I guess they're waiting for... The, well, I guess, you know, budgetary concerns. I mean, you know, they've got to get put together a policy platform to take the election. It's probably a billion dollars. They don't want to forego yet at the moment. But um, oh, look, I can't see why you wouldn't say just junk it. I mean, what, what's the point of it? You're not protecting yeah. anyone. Hold I don't know why I'm getting worked up. I can't afford yeah. a luxury car, but... <laughs> well, yeah, but it's not just a luxury car. You're also paying tariffs on imports. Import That's tariffs true. Too. So I, I think that free trade agreement with Japan got rid of those, I think. But the, the suggestion there still might be 5%, I'm not sure, but um, on, on other imported cars, so... Yeah. Yeah. Wonder watching the budget this year? No, I wouldn't be. I wouldn't be <laughs> holding my breath later. It'll, it'll be there. <laughs> they won't be getting rid of it. Bill Curry from the Financial Review. Thank you for your time. Pleasure, Annalise.